Hello, Dog Nation, and welcome back to the Dog Nation preseason. I'm Kaylee Mansell with Dog Nation insider Connor Riley, and we have got a jam-packed show for you today. So, Connor, let's open it up with this. How about those Hawkeyes? Yeah, you know, Caitlin Clark, big performance. Uh, it was great to watch that. And then, obviously, the UConn-USC game on Monday night. Excited to see UConn-Iowa uh, Friday, and then, obviously, South Carolina NC State. Uh, Caitlin Clark's a lot of fun to watch. I know she might not be everyone's cup of tea, but I find it really interesting to see a great athlete, you know, trying to do something and will her team to a championship. Well, let's go ahead and make it clear that on this show, we stand Caitlin Clark. And if you are not on the bandwagon, you need to hop on it right now before it's too late. But speaking of the show, here's what we've got in store for you today. G day coming up next Saturday and all eyes are on the UGA offense. And with that is UGA, the new standard for offense in college football. And then we're going to talk about NIL recruiting. Is that the most important thing when recruiting a quarterback here on out? And can that be changed in the future? And then we've got another Connor Kaylee showdown. Everybody seemed to love it last week. I know Connor and I had a good time. So we've got another good one in store for you today. All right. So let's open it up with the UGA offense. This is new territory for Georgia, as it seems. They are known for having elite defenses, but it seems that this year the conversation has been shaped around what this UGA offense is going to be capable of with Carson Beck coming back. Here's what Kirby Smart had to say about the UGA offense on Tuesday. Well, your offense can only be as aggressive as the players around you. It's not all on the quarterback. And uh, when I said that about what the category play, that really came more from Mike and the offensive staff. Uh, in terms of uh, allowing him to, to play and play to his strengths, his strengths or his ability to, to navigate the pocket, to make throws, uh, to change plays, and to put us in the right play. That's his great strengths and to use the weapons around him. Um, so I think he'll continue to do that. He's done that thus far. He makes you right a lot. Um, he's very hard to trick and confuse. And when you've got a player like that, as long as he has weapons around him, he can distribute the ball. And our offense has a lot of ways, which you guys have seen in the past. We have a large volume of uh, catchers, meaning it spreads out. We don't necessarily have one guy with you know 150, but we got a bunch of guys with a lot of touches. And the reason we can do that is, is the decision-making that Carson has and the experience he has. So I'm excited to, 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 to see him go play, keeping him healthy and protected is important but also surrounding playmakers that can capitalize on his strengths will make us a better offense. So it seems that this year UGA's got a lot of experience coming back on the offensive side, whether that's leadership, weapons, options. And this is a conversation that is all new to us because all the attention in the past has been on the UGA defense. But Connor, with this year, could Georgia be solidified as the new offensive standard in college football? I think it's going to be interesting to see if they ultimately do that, just because I think for so long the standard has been a lot of points, a lot of passing yards, et cetera. And and Georgia's still going to want to run the football and and score in that way. I think the big barometer for this is going to be Carson Beck touchdown passes. But you go ahead and look at points in recent seasons. Um, You look at how often Georgia is scoring. When Mike Bubba has been Georgia's offensive coordinator the last two seasons, 2014, granted being one of them, and then last season – They've averaged over 40 points per game. And so I I think points are the big emphasis for this Georgia offense. And they've shown that they can do that. Uh, They can show they can do it against good competition. They can do it against mediocre competition. If they go out there and start putting up some big numbers, which it sounds like Kirby Smart has leaned into the idea of doing this season, I I think you're going to start seeing some of the talk around this Georgia team change. You know, I think that Alabama game is a game we talk about a lot. Georgia's only scored more than 30 points against them one time, and they needed a late defensive touchdown to do that back in uh, 2021 in the 2022 National Championship game there. So, you know, if they go out and into Tuscaloosa and score 35 points like they might need to do in that game that day, I think that's a further point where we can go ahead and start talking about this Georgia team as an offensive first one. And for so long, it's been about defense here at Georgia and the way that they want to play in that regard. But Given some of the comments Kirby Smart has made in addition to about his defensive line this week, uh, I, to me, this is, seems like, you know, to quote uh, Lieutenant Caffey, uh, you you cut these guys loose. And, and so I, I think Georgia's getting ready to do that, and we'll see if Kirby Smart is going to do his Colonel Jessup and order the code red. 
Mm -hmm. And and Kirby mentioned in his interview earlier this week with ESPN that he was going to let the cat loose. He thought that last year, especially in that first four-game stretch, that they were protecting Carson Beck from turnovers in a sense, and a lot of that had to do with the play calling between Mike Bobo and Kirby Smart. So this year, knowing what Carson's capable of and knowing his strengths, do you think that there's an opportunity that they're going to even have more touchdowns and points scored in total? I think that's something that, again, it, you know, it all comes down to gameplay and, and how it factors out. But with a tougher schedule ahead, I think Georgia knows that they're going to need uh, their offense to be functioning at their best. And you look at some of the games in recent seasons, you know, obviously the Florida State game jumps to mind, the TCU game jumps to mind. But Ohio State, they had to score 42 points to win that game. The SEC championship game against LSU, they scored 50. Uh, we've seen this Georgia offense in recent times. You know, uh, Ole Miss last year, I think, was 48 Kentucky, which was a top 10 matchup, uh, was in in a similar in the 40s. When they absolutely need to against elite competition, they have shown that they can go out there and score a lot of points. Whether they do that this season, I I think, depends on how much they want to play complementary football, something they always want to do. But the fact that Kirby Smart, and and he's never come out and said it this early about the offense, that they're this far ahead or that they're this, I think, much better than the defense. You know, he might be expectation-setting. Uh, a little bit trying to keep the offense uh, in line while also maybe, you know, uh, setting things for what this defense might look like. But with Carson Beck coming back uh, and what he might be able to do in this offense, I, I think there's a lot of excitement, especially when you factor in the offensive line that Kirby Smart has already hyped up this season as well. So Carson Beck wasn't some big name coming out of high school. Georgia's had bigger quarterbacks recruited in the past. You think about guys like Jacob Eason, Jake Fromm, even the transfer JT Daniels, how much hype's been around them. However, as we mentioned, the conversation has always been about the defense. Kirby Smart produces elite defenses, and we actually went back and looked at the last five times that UGA ranked within the top three for SEC scoring offenses. And even in 2022 and 2021, they ranked, or you see it right here, in 2023, they were second in the SEC, 2022, second in the SEC. Then you have to go all the way back to 2012 to even get within that third place mark, same with 2011, and then you have to go back to two. 2008 to see that for yards per game these are the last five times in the last 20 years that UGA has been in this category but you see that up mark right there with 2022 and 2023 and now we get here and even though UGA led the scoring offense in in 2014 under Air Murray they only went 10 and 3 that year and were Belk Belk Bowl champions so I guess what I'm getting at here is it seems as if the conversation is that UGA's offense is elite this year, but UGA's defense may not be as good. Can UGA win a national championship with an elite offense and a defense that may not have been as good as we've seen in the past? Yes. I think you can look at that 2022 team as a blueprint and, you know, they had some standout moments in the beginning of the year, but by the end of that season, you know, LSU put 30 points on the scoreboard there. Ohio State put 41, and that was without Marvin Harrison in the fourth quarter there. So, you know, Georgia has had to go out and win shootouts before, and I think that 2022 team, uh, the offense and what they were able to do over the course of that season maybe doesn't get enough credit, in part because I think Kirby Smart and Todd Munkin, you know, in games late that season against Kentucky, against Georgia Tech late in the second half, against Tennessee, they sort of downshifted and felt that they didn't need to to put up these big point totals. You've seen them have that recipe for success in the past. I think that's going to be something they're going to have to follow this season. And so it'll be interesting in seeing, you know, you think back to last season, the big standout games, it wasn't necessarily so much a strong defensive effort or, or, you know, aching to what happened, say, against Clemson in 2021 uh, or the first half of the Tennessee game in 2022. Uh, You look at, you know, the Kentucky game, I mentioned the Ole Miss game there. It it was the offense going out there and making big plays and and putting so much pressure on the opposing team that Georgia was able to really take advantage of that. And, And I think that's the recipe that this Georgia team with Carson Beck, with this dominant offensive line, with this group of pass catchers is going to follow in the 2020. Season. So this here is, is is new territory for UJ, and I think the question can be asked that, is the UJ offense getting better or is its defense getting weaker? Because we see that Kirby Smart has taken a new pr- approach to offense, similar to what we saw with Nick Saban in his later years. He was initially known for his strong defenses, then it seemed that his offenses were getting better. But then you take a look back and you think, well, maybe it was just his defense getting weaker over time. And it 
it seems that maybe there are some parallels between the two, but this is what Kirby Smart had to say in an interview with ESPN. The question reads, what's one of the things that has gotten your attention about this team through the first part of spring practice? And Coach Smart says either we're maybe a little weaker on the defensive line or we're really good on the offensive line. The glaring thing I've seen at practices is that the offensive line has done a really good job. That's not to say we were subpar on the defensive line last year. We just weren't great. We didn't have a dominant guy, but we're always going to be good on defense. I don't know that we're going to be great this year, but I think we have a chance to be great on offense. So keep in mind that Kirby Smart said this earlier this week, but I want to go back to what he said Tuesday at his availability. Let's hear that now. I'm not down. I don't know where this is coming from. There is a narrative out there I don't know about. I have no idea what you guys are reading or saying or seeing. So I'm not down on uh, on our run defense. We are not as good as we were that year, but we're better than we've been a lot of other years. So, I mean, there's the scales of of that uh, in terms of that. I, I, I would trade our group for any group in the country in terms of defensive line groups. And it's a, it's a collective whole. Uh, we've got a group that can get the job done. They're going against, you know, one of the best three or four offensive lines that will go against all, all, all season each and every day. So iron sharpens iron, and we're getting better by who we go against. But I, I don't really do the comparison thing, so I'm not, like, going to compare them to, to uh, Devontae Jordan and Jalen, who were – you know, all here at different times. So there was years with those three, and there was years that one of those three was here, and it's buried every year. Okay, so, Connor, I have to ask. Kirby, in a sense, in true Kirby Smart fashion, does essentially contradict what he said in that interview with ESPN when you were in the room with the rest of the media. What was y'all's reaction to hearing what he had to say? Because it almost sounded like he put it on y'all, that y'all were the ones creating the narrative. I mean, look, this is this is classic Kirby Smart here. Uh, he does it later in that same press conference. You hear him mention, you know, they're going against one of the three, four best offensive lines they're going to see all season. And then we ask him about the offensive line later on, and he's saying, oh, you guys are blowing up this offensive line, saying they're one of the three or four best in the country, after he had literally just said that. Uh, you know, I, I think this is maybe Kirby walking back some of what he said in that interview there, I think to most people, they're just going to see, oh, Kirby saying the media is hyping that, hyping this up. Uh, and it's these guys that are out there when saying that, when in fact it was him in a different medium with a one-on-one with a reporter. Uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I think he's right in pointing out that, like, look, you know, and as we get farther and farther away from it, I got 2021 defensive line when you had Jalen Carter, Trayvon Walker, Devontae Wyatt, Jordan Davis – it's just going to be really hard to replicate and having that special collection of talent at that time allowed Georgia to do something very special. Uh, and Jalen Carter, I think singularly is a truly, you know, again, the word gets thrown around a lot, a generational type defender, but I, I think he kind of is that. And, and so, you know, it's still a good defensive line. Uh, it's still, this was a Georgia defense that statistically still ranked uh, among some of the nation's best in several categories last season. But there was a slight drop off specifically in rush defense where they went from a top five unit to, I believe, down in the 30s statistically. So it's sort of managing that aspect of it. And so like Georgia's defense, I still think is going to be really, really good. It's going to be one of the best in the country. But I don't necessarily know. And I think Kirby Smart has already admitted as much if it's going to be the same game altering version that we saw in 2021 and 2022 there it can still help Georgia win a lot and I think the big thing with this group is last year their secondary was elite and so that really helped and I think that uh sort of changed how they try to go about playing this year I think the front seven is going to be a good bit better it might not be what we saw in 2021 but because of that I I think that you're ultimately there with this defensive front as the season progresses, as guys like Christian Miller gets healthy, as guys like Tyrion Ingram Dawkins, Small Munden, so many guys in this front seven are out this spring due to injury. And I do think that colors have a maybe correct Kirby see this group. But ultimately, I do think this group is still good enough to win a national championship for Georgia, even if it is not as quote unquote elite as that 2021 unit happened to be. So I think that we just need to take the 2021 run defense out of the equation. That's like the equivalent of 2019 LSU. 
there's nobody comparable. They were the best of the best in the college football playoff era. So, of course, there's going to be some drop-off. And I think we really saw that drop-off happen in the Auburn game last year. I think that's when eyes definitely opened um, with concern that they just haven't been as strong as they were in the past. But you can't really put that on those players. It's, it was essentially an all-new line. But with this year, you do have some guys coming back. They're a little bit more experienced. And even though there hasn't been a lot of buzz about them in the spring, because like you mentioned, the injuries, when the season gets closer, who are going to need to be those guys on the line that have to step up to at least attempt to get Georgia to a little bit of where it was in those 2021 and 2022 seasons? Uh, you touched. We just touched on there. I think Christian Miller, Tyrion Ingram, Dawkins are two really big names. Obviously, you bring back uh, Warren Brinson and Zero Setcast. But I'm glad you brought up that Auburn game because I actually think, in going back and watching that game and dissecting it, and also some of the larger defensive issues Georgia had last season, it wasn't just on the defensive line. Georgia didn't get great linebacker play last season from the inside linebackers. Mom Munden was hurt all year. Jamon Dumas Johnson misses the end of the season after breaking his arm. And, and so you're playing freshmen like CJ and Raylan Wilson back there. They weren't as good at inside linebacker for a number of reasons last season. And that Auburn game, in my opinion, really highlighted that. So going into this season, because I think the way Georgia always wants to play defensively, they want their linebackers to be the stars of this defense, their linebackers and safeties. And so if you're able to get star level play out of your linebackers, I think that's going to clean up a lot of the issues that we saw. And that's some of the criticism that has gone to the defensive line. Uh, will we'll be rectified there. You need a healthy season out of small London. You need guys like CJ Allen and Raylan Wilson to step up. You need Jalen Walker, I think, to make big strides, which he has this spring into the fall there. Maybe you see what you get out of freshmen like Chris Cole or Justin Williams. If the Georgia inside linebackers play better this coming season, I think we're going to be talking a lot less about this run defense and maybe perhaps the defensive line there as well because of the way that this Georgia defense traditionally wants to play. Well, with G-Day approaching next Saturday, all eyes will be on not just the offense, but the UGA defensive line as too. We will have pre- and post-game coverage on dognation.com. The pre-game show will be at 11 o'clock, and it'll be at the bookstore. So if you're there in Athens, make sure to come see us. And then Brandon Adams' infamous post-game show will start as soon as the game is over, so you can also come check it out in the bookstore. All right, so let's shift the conversation Let's talk about quarterbacks. I thought that you asked Kirby Smart a very interesting question at the Tuesday press conference regarding it's a it's a new era. NIL has really shaped the way that college football recruiting has taken form, but the quarterback position is is what has become so unique. Here's what Kirby Smart had to say about recruiting quarterbacks when it comes to NIL. I don't know that it's changed. I mean, we go about recruiting quarterbacks, but I evaluate quarterbacks. You know, we watch them play high school. We bring them over here and uh, and have them throw for us. We watch their games, which is by far and away the most critical thing we can have. Um, but, I mean, it would probably be a bigger picture of why are we singling out quarterbacks because the NIL has impacted the recruitment of every player. And in terms of where does that rank on their uh, scale, it's one of the first questions of um, is that is that number one priority? Is that number two, three, four, five, six? And do you list it that way because um, you actually feel that way or you just think it's the right answer? You know, it used to be, you know, every kid came in and said, well, the most important thing to me is my education. Well, I don't know many universities you get a bad education at. You know, they don't, they don't hand out bad educations. So is that truly what people were coming to school for 10, 15, 20 years ago? Uh, is it truly what they're coming to school for now at NIL? So I'm answering that question because I don't really understand why specifically it's about quarterbacks. Um, it hasn't, like, our recruitment of quarterbacks or any position hasn't changed what we look at because of NIL, it might change what their motivating factor is, certainly, but not what we look for in terms of criteria. I want a um, self-starter. I want a guy that's committed to the program, the selfless. Uh, I want all the same things, size, speed. I want all those same things. Uh, it's more, be more selective over kids you pick and choose from that the NIL is not the uh, number one narrative. So I think it's safe to say that we are two for two on today's show and capturing the essence of what it's like to sit in on a Kirby Smart coach availability. Now, one thing I do know about you, and this is a humble brag, so take it for what it is, Connery. You are very intentional with your questions. I know that when you go in there and you ask things, it's for a specific purpose. So in asking that question, what is it that you saw or that you've seen over time that propelled you to ask him that? 
Well, look, as we're recording this, uh, Matt Zoller's four-star quarterback is set to announce his commitment later today. By the time this airs, he will have made that decision there. And, and Georgia right now doesn't have a quarterback in the 2025 class. And, you know, look, there's been a lot of discussion this spring about NIL, the impact it has had on this team, obviously Carson Beck driving a Lamborghini around. Mm -hmm. And you've seen, uh, I think, uh, this NIL, and it obviously factors a lot into Juju Lewis, going back to when Juju really first burst on the scene as a national recruit. His dad gave some very strong quotes about Juju's earning possibilities as a high schooler. And while Lewis, I think, and his family have been maybe walking back some of those comments, let's not be naive here and dance around this idea that NAL is a factor in these recruitments. And Kirby Smart, I think, has made it very clear that if you value NIL as a top priority in terms of getting paid up front, Georgia is not necessarily going to be the best place for you. Uh, that is just not something that they believe in value. And so I think when I asked that question in regards to how has NIL impacted recruiting, I think Kirby Smart did his best, Kitty Oppenheimer, and <laughs> said, well, I don't like your question, and therefore I'm not going to answer it. And, and that's his right to do so, and, and you understand that in asking it. And mm -hmm. I can't, because of NCAA rules, can't ask him about Juju Lewis in particular or ask him about Matt Zolders in particular because they're not allowed to comment on unsigned high school recruits. But like NIL and quarterbacks, it's a big thing. Uh, you know, you have the comments made by Matt Rule uh, last December about quarterbacks in the transfer portal get, getting $1 million, one and a half, $2 million. Oh, and then shortly after that, he flips Dylan Raiola from Georgia to Nebraska there. So it's an issue moving forward. NIL with quarterbacks in particular, uh, as Kirby Smart sort of touched on, yes, it is something that is impacting, I think, all recruitments at this point in time. But quarterback in particular, look, Georgia doesn't have one yet in this 2025 recruiting cycle. And you look at the way past recruiting classes have been built. Quarterbacks are so often the leaders. But I think in this current age, uh, NIL has absolutely impacted the way quarterbacks are recruited. Quarterbacks are seen. You have Nico Oliva at Tennessee there. You have Malachi Nelson, formerly of USC, now at Boise State. I think all the money sort of matters in this. And I, I was at least very interested in seeing what Kirby had to smart, had to say about this. And, you know, unfortunately we didn't get uh, an honest answer there, but you know, Kirby's got his right to answer the questions the way that he ultimately wants to. And that's the answer he elected to give there. I like to think it's because you asked a, a tough question. It's, it's hard to provoke a good answer when you're so intelligent that sometimes maybe you don't get all of the questions. So that's a nod to you, but I am glad that you bring up Dylan Raiola because We've talked about it on the show before. Kirby Smart likes having four quarterbacks in the room at the time. Well, right now there's only three. Dylan Raiola would have made four, but then he decides right before signing day, oh, I'm not going to be a cog in a powerhouse. I'm going to go to Nebraska. So then they attempt to go get Jaden Maeva from UNLV, who is a dog for less than 24 hours, decides he's going to head off to USC. Could NIL be the primary reason that Georgia has not been able to acquire a fourth quarterback? I think it's absolutely been a factor in it. You look at what Rayola could possibly earn at Nebraska, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's no secret that USC has very attractive NIL options with it being Los Angeles. You see the success and the luxuries that Caleb Williams had as the quarterback there. Uh, it's absolutely been a factor. And to your point there, we're not sitting here talking about Juju Lewis in this way or Matt Zoller's in this way, Ryan Montgomery in this way if Georgia has a fourth quarterback with multiple years of eligibility left, but because of the fact that Carson Beck is in all likelihood leaving to go to the NFL draft after this season, Georgia's going to need at least one quarterback from the high school recruiting ranks, in my opinion, because I think they're going to go into the transfer portal uh, that opens up on April 16th there and try and go in and bring in a body with multiple years of eligibility. Uh, Kirby wants to get to four quarterbacks. The reality is they're not. And if you forecast ahead if Matt Zollers does not end up picking Georgia Georgia might be looking at two scholarship quarterbacks going into the 2025 season now, obviously a lot can change between now and then but quarterback is a big issue and Georgia's going to have to I, I think be flexible when it comes to some of these NIL discussions and matters because while having the team culture is so important and you want things to be done the right way I think the quarterback position in particular, as we've seen, is vital to the success of this program. So what I'm getting from you, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, is that not having a fourth quarterback at the moment is not necessarily a problem in the short term, but more so a problem in the long term. Because you, you do have Carson Beck coming back. 
Gunnar Stockton's got a lot of hype over this last week, but we do know that Ryan Puglisi was also struggling with a knee injury. So in the grand scheme of things, are you saying that it's okay right now that there's not a fourth quarterback in the room? Yeah, and look, you. I think Kirby has experience with this. You look back at the 2019 season, we're going in, all right, you think you have Jake Fromm, you have Dwan Mathis, you have Stetson Bennett, you feel okay with three. Well, Dwan Mathis has brain surgery and is out for the entire season, and you're functioning with only two scholarship quarterbacks. And I think that limited what Jake Fromm was able to do that season. So since then, he's made an effort to try and have as many capable scholarship quarterbacks as he could possibly have. They didn't have four scholarship quarterbacks last season when they had Carson Beck, Brock Vandergriff, and Gunnar Stockton. But I think Georgia felt very comfortable with all three of those guys because they, at that point, had multiple years in the system. That's not the case this year. This is Ryan Puglisi's first year at Georgia. And so getting a guy that can potentially come in and have experience there, I think, would be something that they targeted. I think that's why they targeted Maeva in the first place. And then going into 2025, look, just having two scholarship quarterbacks is not tenable, especially when you have someone like Gunnar Stockton, who his legs and athleticism are such a big part of his game, but also that leaves him open to hits and also more injuries there. So I, I think quarterback depth is important in all this. And that's why I think it is so critical for Georgia to go out and land a premier option in the 2025 recruiting cycle, whether that still be Juju Lewis. They're going to continue to recruit him. He said to take an official visit to Georgia that first week in May, whether it be Zollers. And if Zollers commits today, maybe all this is for moot. And then Ryan Montgomery, I think, is a third name to know there. He said to visit uh, Georgia in the month of June there as well. So it's all really fascinating how all this comes together. And one of the things in following this program and following these recruitments NIL, for whatever reason, just sort of seems to be a, a, at the center of a lot of this. Yeah, I agree. I do think that this is the new standard when it comes to recruiting quarterbacks, especially those out of high school. So now what I want to do is I want to give you a scenario. Moving forward, this is just how things are going to be. And we know that the quarterbacks that are five stars, that are within the top ten they're going to be asking for a lot of compensation or expecting it. So do you think that Kirby's going to take the route of, okay, let me go out and get a five-star quarterback, maybe the number one quarterback in the class, and build around him with four stars and three stars? Or do you take the approach of going to get a four-star quarterback and building better guys around him? Because in my opinion, what we've seen in the NFL, you need an elite quarterback. You need your Patrick Mahomes. But then you look at college football and you look at somebody like J.J. McCarthy, for example. I didn't view him as an elite quarterback, and yet Michigan was still able to win the national championship. And there are probably going to be four quarterbacks that go before him in this year's NFL draft. So when it comes to Kirby Smart, what approach do you think that he's going to take? And do you agree with that approach? I think he still wants to build on the lines of scrimmage. So that means loading up on offensive linemen and defensive linemen. I think that's where he wants to put his NAL dollars. Brandon Adams has done a great job talking about this and pointing out the importance of that. And like, look, Carson Beck wasn't a mega name recruit. Stetson Bennett, anybody could have had him. Mm -hmm. uh, and you saw both those guys develop into successful quarterbacks. So clearly Georgia is doing something right in terms of identifying talent and, and landing guys. I'd also point out, of all the five-star quarterbacks that Kirby Smart has landed in his time at Georgia, Jacob Eason, Justin Fields, Brock Vandegrift, will include JT Daniels in there as well if we want to. All those five-star quarterbacks, you know what they all have in common, Kaylee? They all ended up transferring out of the program. So I think that you know Georgia feels very comfortable in what they're doing with quarterback development and targeting the guys and knowing what to look for there. But I think with NIL, and this is the issue, it's thrown, I think, a little bit of a wrench into the guys that they wanted to sort of go after and pursue. Because even on the lower end, you know, you look at someone like Zollers, he's not the five-star quarterback. He's not uh, a Juju Lewis, uh, who I think is the big reason he's connected to Georgia is just the proximity there. You look at, you know, back to Zollers, you know, the fact that, you know, he's not a top-end quarterback, but he's still obviously, a, you know, a top 100 overall player. You have a program like Missouri potentially coming in and throwing a sizable NIL offer at him, and that just makes it tough to compete with because you want to spend those dollars on those offensive linemen and defensive linemen who, over the course of their college careers, perhaps may not make as money as, say, a quarterback does, as we've seen with Stetson Bennett and Carson Beck, but are vital to the development of this program. All right, Connor. So let me let me get you one more thing right here, just because it seems like people within Dog Nation cannot get enough of the Juju Lewis content. You've got a guy like Juju Lewis who is committed to USC. 
Personally, I don't think that's where he's going to end up. I don't know if he ends up at Georgia. I don't think that he's going to end up at USC. This is a guy who's being described as having Caleb Williams-type talent. Once in a generation, I believe that he was the number one player ranked amongst all four classes that are currently in school, and he's an in-state kid. Would you rather have a guarantee that we're going to get Juju for the maximum amount of money, or would you rather take a guy like Zollers and build around him? Uh, I, I would not break the bank for Juju Lewis. I, uh, you know, I, I do agree with Kirby Smart in the sense that you know, paying top dollar for an unproven quarterback, uh, it, it, there are a lot of risks involved with that. And, and so I, I think you want guys to prove that they can play, that they can last in the Georgia program. Georgia is very fond of saying this program isn't for everyone. And, and so I'd be really interested in seeing, you know, potentially – one of the issues, you know, let's say you you pay top dollar to get Juju Lewis and you commit to what he wants from an NIL standpoint, he's also going to want to play right away so that he can get those Carson Beck, mm-hmm. Caleb Williams type down the road type NIL dollars. But he may not help you win more going in, say, 2025 than, say, a Gunnar Stockton does or Ryan Puglisi does or Transfer Portal Player X does. And, and so those are sort of the decisions there you have to make. I think when you look at the reason why Georgia so much focuses on the defensive and offensive lines when it comes to NIL there, those guys don't play right away a whole lot because they just had to physically develop, and it takes more time there to do that. And, and so you can preach patience there with them. With quarterbacks, while it's rare, you have seen guys come in and play right away as freshmen. You even mentioned J.J. McCarthy. He played a key role for that Michigan team back in 2021 as a freshman there. So I think with quarterback, it is a position that you can play as a freshman. We've seen it happen at Georgia. Jacob Eason did it. Jake Fromm did it and nearly led Georgia to a national title. So I, it, it, granted, that was a long time ago, and it's a different time. I, I do agree with Kirby Smart's sentiment there that you shouldn't pay top dollar to these quarterbacks, to these unproven guys, just because you think you might need them. Uh, Georgia is one of the most successful programs in college football over the last five years. Uh, they clearly have a good idea of how NIL works and what works for this program. It just comes at a very interesting time where quarterback is a position going forward where there are some question marks. And NAL, in some ways, can help answer a lot of them, but it can also cast even further questions with how you want to go about building your team. I think what you just said sums up the essence of what we're trying to capture in this conversation is the fact that when it comes to recruiting quarterbacks, it will never be the same because of NIL. To be able to go out and get those five-star guys, you're going to have to pay top dollar. But as you mentioned, with what would have been the top dollar quarterbacks from Georgia in the past, like Jacob Eason, like Justin Fields, it doesn't always work out because they haven't had the opportunity to prove themselves. But I know that us as Dog Nation can put our trust in Kirby Smart to pick the best ones and build around him. And I think that's the best thing that they can do as dogs moving forward as they propel towards this new offensive standard. And I know that Connor put out an article about this earlier this week, so you can check that out on the homepage of dognation.com or check it out on Connor's Twitter feed at K Connor Riley. All right. We did it last week, our very first ever Connor Kaylee showdown. In case you need to recap, all you need to know is that I won, but we're going to let Connor have the opportunity to redeem himself right here. So it's time for yet another Connor Kaylee showdown. It's time for the Connor Kaylee showdown. Well, this is the Connor Kaylee Showdown where we are going to go head to head. I do think it's important to note that CKS is not only a nod to us, Connor Kaylee, but also all of you that are on message boards, CKS, Coach Kirby Smart, we got to give a nod to the GOAT himself. New topic today, but there was also a new rule in place in light of Connor's whining at the end of the show last week that this week Connor did not have to send me his answers ahead of time. Instead, we both sent our answers to our fabulous referee, Cody Chapins, who put all the graphics together. he only He's the only one who knows what's going to go down today. So let's welcome in Cody. All right. I want you guys, again, we want a clean fight, but let's get it on. That's what we like to see. Cody always brings that good energy, and I, I trust in his judgment and that he's going to make the right decision today, which will be my answer. But, again, we're just going to let Cody have his moment. Since I won last week, Connor, you can go first. All right. Uh, I will go first here. The thing we are deciding is 
if there is a future Georgia game that you would like to be seen and played, where would it be? Because obviously the comments made by Josh Brooks last week about the future of the UCLA series uh, left some doubt as to what Georgia might ultimately be doing. They have a home and home tentatively scheduled with UCLA for the 2025 and 26 seasons. But with the SEC changing its schedule structure, the Big Ten as well there, uh, Josh Brooks left open the possibility that that game might not be played. And so we thought, all right, you're going to build a Georgia game that fans can go and see what would be the best game that you could possibly build. And so leading off the team that they are going to be playing is a big 10 team. And this sounds very weird to say, uh, I have Georgia playing the USC Trojans. Uh, it will not be in Los Angeles because I understand some people may not love that city and there isn't exactly a great stadium. I think for them, for that game to be played in the Rose Bowl, the Rose Bowl, but the Rose Bowl is really only the Rose Bowl on January 1st, LA Coliseum and so far, it could be, you know, it's a dome stadium, but it could be raining. So we're going to make this a neutral site game. And we are going to go down to the bayou of New Orleans. Georgia has played there before, but it is usually in the Sugar Bowl in December. It's the holidays. A lot of people may not want to go, especially when it was not a college football playoff game. We do this Labor Day weekend in the bayou. I think it'd be a ton of fun. Kirby Smart and Lincoln Riley could not be more different in terms of the way that they have gone about things. USC, as we just sort of mentioned, big NIL program. And you, Lincoln Riley has always been offense first. Kirby has always been seen as a defense first guy. I think they're both dealing maybe with some changes that come with that. And the fact that the last time these two coaches went head to head against each other was that iconic 2018 Rose Bowl. I think there'd be a lot of really juicy storylines there. And the fact that we're doing it Labor Day weekend in New Orleans means Georgia fans are going to get up to all kinds of fun. I think it'd be a great weekend for this program. And I think Georgia could win the game there as well. So I've got Georgia playing USC in New Orleans Labor Day weekend. Really, Connor? Labor Day weekend in New Orleans? Do you want to see half of Dog Nation pass out of heat stroke? Is that what we're getting at here? I mean, it's it's hot everywhere the last week in August, first week in September. So no matter where you're going, it, it's it's not exactly going to be a great time. You know what? I'm not going to lie. When I saw USC come up on the board, I thought, okay, not a bad pick. Then you lost me at New Orleans. I mean, I just, I would do, obviously I would not have minded going there for the college football playoffs last year as a number one seed, but I will avoid the city of New Orleans any opportunity that I get. You either love it or you hate it, and I think that that's what this is ultimately going to come down to is that I think that more people will agree with me versus yours. I do think it's going to be 50-50. One thing I would point out, you know, you talk about the heat there. That's a dome stadium. You got people inside that are working, enjoying the game. It's going to be nice and air conditioned during the game. I do think that that is something to keep in mind there. Okay, well, if you're in New Orleans, there's going to be a lot of pre-gaming, a lot of outdoor tailgating. They might be fine once they get in there, but I'm not saying that all Georgia fans are going to come back from that trip. I mean, well, no matter what time of year you go to New Orleans, that's the case. All right, well, again, let me just go ahead and tell you why. You are wrong. Now, Connor, I'm glad that you addressed the topic because this is something that we talked about on Tuesday's episode of Dog Nation Daily. And I initially gave my answers. I would like to see Georgia in a Las Vegas opener. And I have to admit that that some of that bias comes from me because I really just want to go to Las Vegas because I've never been. And I want to make sure that it's real and not some myth. But when I really sat down and thought about this, I thought, no. We need a home and home series against an opponent that we've played less than five times that has some personal tie to it, similar to what Connor's storyline said between Lincoln Riley and Kirby Smart. So here's what I have UGA doing for their replacement game for UCLA. We're going to open it up at Nebraska. Let's go ahead and go play Dylan Riola right off the bat. I mean, he said that Nebraska's purpose in his heart brightly being, well, let's go show him that that purpose is so Nebraska can go, what, five and seven, six and six again. We've only played Nebraska three times, and all three times that Georgia and Nebraska have matched up, they have all been on neutral site. Now, UGA is one and two all time, so let's go ahead and give the opportunity to make it even. And I do want to play at Memorial Stadium because they've sold out 396 consecutive games. Could you imagine smacking down 
on the Cornhuskers in front of 85,000 people, a sold-out crowd. I know a lot of people are saying that Nebraska is going to be a dark horse in the Big Ten this year, but let's go ahead and put them in the spotlight and see what they're capable of against not only one of the best offenses in college football, but also the best defenses. Go ahead and, I mean... Like I said, we've never played there before. I think that would be cool, but I think that there's a lot of personal things that go into this game, and I think it would just mean more. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, you put me to sleep there when you picked a Nebraska program that has one winning season in the last eight years. Uh, you know, flying into Lincoln, Nebraska, I, I don't exactly know what Lincoln is known for uh, other than selling out football games to see a mediocre football program. I feel very comfortable in my pick and my selection here. Lincoln, Nebraska, Lincoln, Riley. That's that's where I'm at. I mean, Lincoln, Riley has more winning seasons than Lincoln, Nebraska does in the last eight I years. just, with, with his supposedly once-in-a-lifetime quarterback gone, I just don't see the storylines around that game being as big as if we had played them a year ago. But Dylan Raiola former Georgia quarterback commit who decided to change his decision one day before signing day. You can't tell me that UGA fans wouldn't be excited for that. I mean, I'll point out USC has a quarterback who was a one-time Georgia commit who then changed oh his my decision to get in my Ava there. So oh my gosh. I that out. All right. Well, uh, we are going to hand it off to our wonderful referee, Cody Chapins, who I 100% trust will make the right decision here. All right. I appreciate it, guys. I, I love the ideas. I will start with Kaylee. Um, the idea of playing Dylan Raiola, I can't wait to think <clears throat> what poetry this young man might write after being sacked by Georgia five or six times. I do like the venue going to Nebraska. But here's my worry with yours. I think back to that Sugar Bowl that Georgia played against Hawaii. I don't know if you remember that. Colt Brennan came in as this big, hyped-up quarterback. And by the end, you almost felt sorry for him because Marcus Howard just kept pounding the guy into the ground. And so I feel like this has a chance. We might feel sorry for Dylan Raiola at the end of this because we know Nebraska – is not quite where they need to be yet to compete with a team like Georgia. So that's my big worry there. I do like the venue. On Connor's side with Lincoln Riley and Southern Cal in New Orleans, having gone to some of those Sugar Bowls recently, yes, we've been there and done that, but every time we are there, it's New Year's Eve, and it's miserable. The weather is never really that much fun. It's way too crowded. I would love to see New Orleans in Labor Day weekend, and I do like that Connor narrowed down exactly when he wants to go and the team he wants to play. I think Southern Cal, what a statement Georgia can make. Hey, Big Ten, this is your team you wanted to – oh, you brought in Southern Cal. I think you could send a statement to the Big Ten as well, the big SEC Big Ten uh, rivalry that is starting to build now. So, for this one, week two, I'm going to go with – Connor Riley, he's going to get the win for Southern Cal in New Orleans on Labor Day weekend. That's my ruling, and it's final. Thank you so much, Cody. Uh, I'm glad you made the right decision there. Uh, I, we will do hurricanes in New Orleans if this game ever ends up actually happening. I cannot wait for that. I wish I could take Eddie's tape off of him right now and say, if I can't see the scoreboard, then I don't really know what the score is. So if anybody has any extra, please let me know. But you know what? Um, if there's anything that I gathered and learned from watching last week's show, it's that I'm not going to handle myself the way that Connor did. I will accept defeat like the bigger person that I am and allow you to have this moment. And I will celebrate with you as your friend and fellow coworker, Congratulations, but this is probably going to be the last time that you ever get another point on that scoreboard. So enjoy it while you can. You know, when you win, say little. Uh, when you lose, say little. And when you win, say less. At so. a loss for words? Yep. All right. Well, that was our second ever Connor Kaylee showdown. Put your thoughts in the comments. We want to know where would you want to go? Who did you, uh, who in your mind won? Because last week, I will say in the audience, the answers were divided up a little bit, but it all comes down to our wonderful referee, Cody Chaffins. So with that, that is the Connor Kaylee Showdown. We will hopefully have more of those for you in the future. And speaking of the future, guys, we have big news for you next week. There's been a lot of speculation 
A lot of rumors, a lot of talk going around Dog Nation, but we are going to get to the bottom of it next week and show you guys what we have been working on, and we could not be more excited. Dog Nation, as always, thank you so much for joining us. If you're just now joining us for the first time, you can check all of Connor and I's Dog Nation preseason shows out on our YouTube page on dognation.com, which is always free, by the way. And moving forward, we've got some big news, so you're definitely going to want to make sure to tune in to next week's show. With that, I am Kaylee Mansell with now first-time winner of the Connor Kaylee Showdown. Connor Riley, we will see you right back here next Thursday at 7 o'clock.